Holly Bobo was a 20-year-old girl from Tennessee who was studying to become a nurse. Midway through her studies, Holly unexpectedly went missing in April of 2011. The last time anybody saw Holly alive was when she was spotted by her brother inside the family's garage, speaking with a man sounding distraught and terrified. This unidentified man kidnapped Holly and forced her into a nearby patch of woods. Police were called, but it was too late. By the time they arrived, the man was gone. Holly Bobo was your average girl from Darden, Tennessee. She loved all things outdoors, as is evidenced by the many photos showing her and her family in camouflage outfits wandering the wilderness. But Holly wasn't the outgoing woman that she may have appeared to be on the outside. She was actually quite shy and timid, but was certainly confident in herself as an individual. Holly grew up in Darden, Tennessee, a relatively small community with a population of just under 3,000 people. Darden appears to be a fairly quiet, secluded area as far as I can tell, a great place to raise a family. Most people regard Darden as a middle-class community, with crime being very low and the cost of living being equally low. All things considered, Darden is the perfect place to settle down and begin life with the people that you hold close. When she wasn't spending time with her family in Darden, Holly was attending her usual college classes in Parsons at the University of Tennessee's Martin Parsons Center studying to become a nurse. The center was a relatively small building that housed a few hundred students, predominantly teens and young adults, who were studying for a profession in the medical field. You can think of this campus as somewhat of an outlet, so to speak. For example, you may see large clothing stores in major cities, take Kohl's for example. But in smaller towns, you may only have access to a Kohl's outlet, which is more or less just a smaller version of Kohl's with fewer options. Well, that's essentially what the Martin Parsons Center is, just a small outlet version of the much larger University of Tennessee, which is several cities away in Knoxville. Despite being a small town with a large college community though, Parsons wasn't too far off from Darden, both in terms of location and amenities. Parsons is also a very small town, and there isn't much really going on here outside of college classes and a few small shops. Parsons would be a great place to visit to get away from all the noise and interference of daily life, but it certainly wouldn't be the place where you would expect a strange, shockingly violent crime to occur, one that would gain nationwide attention and lead police on a multi-year hunt for a dangerous criminal. It was the morning of April 13th, 2011. Holly woke up early that morning at around 4.30 a.m. to begin studying for an upcoming exam. Everything went as expected for several hours. At around 7.30 a.m., Holly received a call from her boyfriend, Drew Scott, who'd spent most of the morning turkey hunting on his grandparents' property. By this point, Holly's parents had already left for work, and Holly's brother Clint was asleep in his bedroom. It would be just 12 minutes later, at about 7.45 a.m., when Holly would make her final phone call. After this, every call and text that rang through would remain unanswered, leaving Holly's family desperately wondering what could have happened. Just minutes after Holly ended the call with her boyfriend, neighbors reported hearing screams coming from the Bobo household. The neighbor, a young man who lived with his parents, called his mother to report what he had heard. The mother, in turn, called Holly's mother to let her know that something was wrong. By this point, Holly's brother had been woken up by the family dogs barking and growling, so he jumped up to go see what was going on. As he looked out the window, he reported that he saw Holly and an unidentified man standing near the family's garage. He mentioned that the man looked remarkably similar to Drew, Holly's boyfriend. In fact, at first, he believed the man was Drew. He said that it seemed as though the two were kneeled down looking at one another. They were talking back and forth, but he couldn't make out anything that they were saying. All he knew is that Holly sounded incredibly upset, but she wasn't saying much. The man was doing most of the talking. The only thing Holly's brother was able to make out was that Holly at one point replied to the man saying no, then later began asking him why. At some point during the argument, Holly's brother Clint received a call from his mother. Clint detailed everything that he had seen to his mom, adding that he thought Holly and Drew were breaking up in the garage. It was clear, at this point, Clint had no idea that Holly was in danger. But that's when Holly's mother told Clint 
that's not Drew. Clint was then ordered by his mother to fire at the man, but Clint was in disbelief. While he couldn't see the man clearly, he fully believed that this was Holly's boyfriend. Clint replied to his mother, pleading, you want me to fire at Drew? It seems likely Holly's mother grew frustrated at this point because she hung up the phone and called the police. But because she was calling from her work phone, her number rang through to the wrong county of officers, wasting precious time and ultimately giving the unidentified man further time to conceal the situation even further. By the time Clint was informed of all this and looked out the window again, the two had already left the garage and were headed towards the nearby woods. It was at this point that Clint finally realized for himself this man was not Drew. He was much larger than Drew, but Clint still couldn't get a good look at him. Clint tried to call Holly's phone at this point, but she obviously didn't answer. He tried to call Drew as well, but Drew wasn't answering. By this point, Holly's mother called Clint once again, saying that she was having no luck contacting the police. She asked Clint to call the police instead, and Clint then grabbed his weapon and headed outside, and that's when he found red stains near the garage that presumably belonged to Holly. It was at this point that he agreed to call the police. It would take investigators around 10 minutes to reach the Bobo household, by which point Holly and the suspect were long gone. Police searched the area, but they didn't find anything that would lead them to either Holly or the criminal. Police requested phone records for Holly's phone, and they soon began using the GPS data from her device to pinpoint her last known location. They quickly determined that her cell phone had traveled through the woods near her home just as Clint had suggested. Movement stopped near Interstate 40, then picked up again, returning in the direction from where the device originally came from. Detectives were sent out to investigate the section of woods where the phone movement had stopped, but they came up empty-handed. The area didn't appear to have been recently disturbed, and there were no signs of Holly. Unfortunately, this left officers at a dead end as the case reached its first roadblock. But search teams were about to uncover mountains of evidence pertaining to Holly's case. After they uncovered Holly's personal items that had been scattered all throughout the town, almost as if the suspect was taunting the family and the locals. When officers went back to the family home and began speaking with Clint, he described the unidentified man as being about 5 foot 10 and maybe as tall as 6 feet, weighing about 200 pounds with dark hair and a hat. He added that the man appeared to be wearing mossy oak brand camouflage and that he had a very deep, low voice. He couldn't make out any distinguishing features about the man's face. And considering Parsons was a fairly rural town filled with hunters and outdoorsmen, the description that Clint gave police essentially described every male living within a 30 mile radius. Search teams were sent all over the town to search for any clues or possible witness sightings. It didn't take investigators long to come across several pieces of evidence scattered all throughout the town. As police patrolled the area, they found several items that belonged to Holly abandoned throughout the town. They found her lunchbox, a receipt with her name on it, a card from her school, and some reports even claim that they found her cell phone and later her SIM card, though other reports indicate that the phone and SIM card were found in the woods, much closer to Holly's home, so take that as you will. Police initially narrowed down their list of suspects and began investigating one man in particular, named Terry Britt. Terry was a registered offender who fit the bill of the man that Clint had seen in the garage that day. Investigators went as far as wiretapping Britt's home and searching his property, but they ultimately found nothing of interest and he was cleared as a suspect. It wouldn't be until three years later, in 2014, that the case would see any more progress. Ginseng hunters were traveling through the woods near Interstate 40 when they came across a crime scene unlike anything they could have ever expected. Police were called to the scene, and they unfortunately revealed that they had uncovered the partial remains of Holly Bobo. She was about 20 miles away from Darden. When investigators spoke with the owner of the property, he revealed it wasn't uncommon for locals to hunt in the area without permission, so he wasn't too terribly shocked that the hunters and investigators managed to find her there all these years later. When investigating the scene of the crime, police revealed that bones had been scattered all throughout the area, but that Holly had likely lost her life after taking a single round to the head. It was at this point that police revealed that they'd honed in on their primary suspect, but as it would turn out, they'd been investigating the man for at least six months prior to this discovery. 
But what makes things incredibly strange is that he was just one of six men who are believed to have had connections to Holly's case. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. The first of the arrests in Holly's case took place in March of 2014, several months before the discovery of the crime scene. Zach Adams, his brother Dylan, and their friend Jason were all suspected of aggravated kidnapping. On top of this, police had enough evidence to suggest that the men had taken advantage of Holly before claiming her life. After bringing these three in for questioning, police also arrested two other men who they believed helped to conceal Holly's remains. There was another man who investigators believed may have been involved as well, but he claimed his own life before he could be properly investigated. One detail that we don't know much about is what led police to suspect any of these men had any connection to the case. For some reason, police have never explained this aspect of the investigation, though it's probably safe to assume that it's either none of our business, as it may have been a private matter, or to protect the integrity of the investigation, or both, we just don't know. The only thing we know for sure is that Dylan Adams had been arrested on an unrelated weapons charge in 2014. While he was speaking with police, Dylan explained that he had seen Holly alive at his brother's house quite some time after her abduction. The details of a search warrant claimed that Dylan had witnessed Holly at Zach Adams' home on April 13, 2011, the same day that Holly disappeared. Dylan revealed that he'd visited his brother's home that day to borrow his truck, but when he went inside, he noticed Holly sitting in a chair in the living room in a very bad state. Dylan claims that his brother then revealed that he'd taken advantage of Holly and recorded the entire ordeal, but this recording has never been found. Dylan also explained that Zach had been wearing camouflage clothing that day, which matched the description that Holly's brother had given to investigators. The only problem with all this information is that Dylan would later recant his confession, claiming he was coerced by investigators. Worse yet, this seems to be true, because some of the finer details that he'd shared with police simply don't add up with the evidence that's been uncovered. And this may be why the aforementioned video has never been found, because it doesn't exist. Regardless of this, the confession proved to be useful enough to allow investigators to arrest Zach Adams, Jason Autry, and Shane Austin all three of which were men who police heavily suspected were involved in the case, with Shane being the man that I mentioned a moment ago who took his own life before going to trial. This left Zach and Jason to tell their side of the story. In a dramatic turn of events, it didn't take police long at all to convince Jason that he would be looking at spending the rest of his life behind bars if he didn't help investigators close the case. Naturally, he changed his tune rather quickly once he was in police custody and offered to testify against Zach in exchange for a lesser sentence. Police agreed to these terms, and it was at this point that the case was blown wide open. In the months leading up to the trial, an attorney for Shane Austin, the man who took his own life, spoke out against the police who were investigating the case, and announced that detectives had no evidence against Shane whatsoever. He claims that police were pursuing theories, hearsay, and rumors rather than actual evidence. He claims that they continually threatened Shane, leading him to believe he was going to be pinned for a crime that he didn't commit. His attorney claims that this is the reason why Shane took his life, and his family holds the police responsible for his demise. There's been no word of any lawsuits that may be filed, but I think it's safe to say that those will eventually be coming sooner or later. But by September of 2017, Zach Adams was sent to trial. During his trial, it was alleged that Clint, Holly's brother, actually knew her attackers. Jason, the man who agreed to testify against Zach, claims that he, Zach, and Dylan had all visited the Bobo household that day in order to teach Clint how to make illegal substances. At some point during this process, Holly found out about it and began to freak out, exiting the house while shouting. These would have been the shouts that the neighbor initially heard, prompting the police to be called a short while later. This would have explained why Clint was so reluctant to spring into action when it became painfully clear that his sister was in trouble, because he knew the attackers and what they were capable of. Once Holly began shouting and trying to flee the home, the men allegedly grabbed her and abducted her in order to keep her quiet. They later took her to a barn where they took advantage of her and took her life. The only problem with these allegations is that Clint claims they're untrue, 
and there's no real evidence to suggest that things took place one way or the other, so we're ultimately forced to take them as nothing more than hearsay and false rumors. Both Jason and Dylan gave conflicting accounts about what took place on the day that Holly disappeared. The most accurate form of the story that I can gather seems to suggest that following whatever took place at Holly's home that day, Holly was taken to the aforementioned bar. Zach, Dylan, and Jason were all involved somehow or another, with Zach being the mastermind behind the operation. Zach eventually attempted to claim Holly's life, then rolled her up in a rug, placed her in the back of his truck, taking her out to the woods off of Interstate 40. But once the trio arrived in the woods, they learned that Holly was still alive. This is what led to the single round to the back of her head. This weapon was later found abandoned in a body of water cleared of any fingerprints or DNA. Before his trial, Zach's girlfriend had spoken out against him, claiming that he had admitted to the crime and claimed he'd do the same thing to her if she mentioned a word of it to anyone. Zach had allegedly also threatened his brother Dylan with the same consequence if he spoke to anyone about the case. In the end, Zach was found guilty of all charges. He was sentenced to life in prison, with Dylan, his brother, being given 50 years, serving 35 before parole will be considered. Jason, on the other hand, doesn't appear to have played any active role in the crime outside of helping the two brothers cover their tracks. For his participation in the trial and the conviction, it appears as though he was allowed to walk away a free man. Now, I need to reiterate, the story of Holly's abduction and her subsequent demise have not been fully proven. There were so many lies and rumors being tossed around during the trial that it's difficult to make heads or tails of the situation. The story I shared regarding the consequences of events leading to Holly being dumped in the woods is purely the aspects of the story that make the most sense based on the evidence that's been found. In the end, there's so much more to the story that I couldn't share here because it would take literal hours to cover every aspect of the investigation and the arrests. So I'd urge you, if you're interested, take a closer look at this case on your own and establish your own conclusions. All we know for sure is that for one reason or another, Holly was taken from this world far too soon by two sadistic and evil brothers who had nothing better to do with their time than wreak havoc on a small town and torment a young woman who just wanted nothing more than to live her life in peace. Holly's tragic demise has left a permanent scar on an otherwise beautiful town, and her memory will not be soon forgotten. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you want to see other cases like this, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. I post new true crime documentaries every week, so be sure to stick around. If you want to help support the channel, the best way you can do that is by leaving a comment below. Any comment at all. That type of thing really helps out the channel more than you may realize. If you'd like to help out financially, you can click the blue join button below this video. But with that, my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.